Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Stephen O'Brien. Thanks for being on the show, Stephen. Thank you for having me. Now, I'm honored to have Stephen on the show. He is, uh, I mean, he's a, a perfect guest for the show. He's with his experience and his company's experience. They, they have been in this business for a long time, and, and he has lots of expertise that he's going to share with us today that I know you are going to find uh, relevant in your business and things you need to know. But first, I want to remind you to go to LifeBridge Capital, go to the Contact Us page and connect with me so we can get on the call, uh, get on the phone, schedule a call with you, uh, and uh, happy to help you any way that I can. Go to the Facebook group, The Real Estate Syndication Show, where you can leave questions for guests, you know, and experts just like Stephen, and so we can get your uh, questions answered. And so uh, go there and, and get active in the group. And then, but a little about Stephen O'Brien, he is the co-founder and chief investment offer of Arkin Capital, was responsible for the identification, acquisition, management, and reporting of over 25 multifamily assets totaling over $300 million in value. He secured the placement of nearly $200 million in financing with FMNA, FMAC, HUD, HUD Bank, and insurance uh, company sources. So, Stephen, th thank you so much for uh, your time and sharing with us today on the show. Give us a little more about who you are and the company and, and even where you're located. And let's jump in uh, to this as a topic that I know everybody wants to know about. Sure. Yeah. Uh, um, Arkin Capital is the name of our company. We're based in Atlanta, uh, on the north side of town. And we focus on the southeastern United States, um, almost exclusively value add uh, apartment investing. Um, we have been uh, at Arkin Capital uh, for about three years now, um, founded in mid-2016. But prior to that, my business partners and I have worked together uh, acquiring multifamily since 2012, and I've been in real estate since 2006. Nice. And would you share just like the, you know, a minute or two minute version of, of how you got into this business too? And I thought, I thought that was relevant to, uh, you know, the listeners as well. Sure, absolutely. I, I actually found my way into real estate because uh, I was an analyst. So I started with CBRE doing financial analysis in Excel models, Argus, um, which is not really pertinent to multifamily, but Argus is one of those real estate software uh, tools for office and, and retail and hotel that, that's used um, in industrial. So um, we, I got started there and, and gradually built up my expertise until a point that uh, the right opportunity presented itself to get on the principal side where I always wanted to do some investing. And that was my foot in the door for lack of a better term. So um, I found my way in through my you know Excel knowledge and analysis ability and was able to transform it into a, a role as a principal. No, that's great. And I love stories like that because people are, I mean, I get so many calls every week that says, you know, Whitney, how do I get into this business? How do I get started? And so, you know, I hear different, different ways people got in and, but it's more times than not, it's you, you develop some type of skill so you could add value to some other team, somebody that was doing, you know, doing this already and, uh, and, you know, underwriting and, and Excel is a, a great skill to have in this business, right? Um, and so, yeah, you said you built your own model, I think, and, and uh, we're very proficient at it. But, but our topic for today and, and something you're, you know, you are uh, well versed in is, just, you know, what you all are doing at this, you know, in the market cycle right now, this end of the cycle, how you're preparing for this, what do you think is happening and, and what you are, you all are doing to prepare for whatever might be coming. And, and so it's a, it's a very relevant topic. And, and uh, I love that you wanted to talk about that and elaborate how you all are preparing for this, but, but get us started a little bit on, on you know, obviously y'all are value add uh, company and, and, uh, but what are you doing to prepare for this possible or potential downturn that everyone is talking about? Yeah, I think um, the reason it's it's so pertinent is is as you said, it's it, everybody's talking about it and everybody's starting to talk about it. In fact, it was funny. Uh, we I was recently at an event where they were talking about they were getting tired of talking about what inning we were in. <laughs> um, so you know, if you go back to even sixteen when we founded our company, we thought the the cycle had a lot more legs left to it. But there were a lot of people in two thousand sixteen that thought we were near the end, and there was a lot of data that pointed to it. Um, now we actually do believe we're getting 
closer to the end of this cycle. And we would say that we're approaching or are in the ninth inning already uh, for a number of reasons. But um, what, what we think the best way to do or the best things to do to prepare for that and the end of the cycle is uh, largely involving investors, which, you know, uh, regarding syndication. And, and um, we found that when your investors understand what's going on in the market real time, you can set expectations and then you could deliver on those expectations because, you know, case in point, um, when I got started in real estate in 2006, 2008 and nine, if you were buying real estate and getting a five or an 8% return that you bought in 2007, eight, nine, people were pretty darn happy. So it's, it's always about what the expectation is in the market. The challenge for us today is, um, returns have been so good for so long that we're finding it's taking some time to get back to the investors and get them prepared for the fact that those 25, 35 IRRs are probably going to start coming down as cap rates are compressing and a lot of the returns are compressing. The investors are going to feel that and there just aren't quite as many of the lucrative deals out there in our opinion as prices go up and, and rent growth is starting to slow. It's still there, but it's starting to slow. So yeah. I think step number one for us is really preparing our investors and, and talking to people about uh, the change on the market. I love that. Uh, I love how, uh, you know, you're talking about preparing the investors. And, and I think when you are, you're educating them about the market, like all of a sudden when you have to explain why, you know, the returns, you're projecting smaller returns or lesser returns, it, like it's, it's easier to understand why that's happening. Right. Yeah, ab right? absolutely. Yeah. So, and you know, Hey, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I was going to say, and, and you've got to keep in mind, most of our investors, and I think like most of the investors out there, very few people only invest in real estate. So one of the things that it's important to be aware of and prepare them for is, uh, you know, a lot of the people that I talk to that are uh, investors in equity markets, they also think things are overpriced. So it's not uh, a story that's just confined to real estate. Um, it's something that as you get out there and you communicate with your investors and you can come up with new strategies for ways to make people money, um, even, even changes in the, the model of how you raise it and how you deploy it. Okay. So, you know, what are some tips for how you all have prepared your investors for that? Well, we, we try and keep in constant contact with our investors. So one of the things we do is, uh, we have monthly reports and quarterly reports. Um, we also have a newsletter that we are preparing to launch. So, uh, I think the key thing is if you stay in constant contact with your investors, you're almost reminded to update them as things are happening, whether it's via phone um, or, or even a quarterly call or a monthly call so that they can get real time data from what's happening on, on the property. And for us, because we are a property manager, um, we can give very accurate real time data to the, here's how many applications we got this week, or here's what the lease rates are doing this week. And it, and those changes in those numbers is, as rental rates start declining or as you're getting less and less traffic, that's very quickly going to reach the bottom line and, and change some of the returns. So uh, those are some of the things that we do. Um, reporting is an important function of, of our, our process. Okay. So educating the investors and the reporting, letting them know what's happening and whether it's phone calls, monthly, quarterly reports, and uh, you know, what, are, what are some of the next steps? Yeah, I think uh, the other thing that we really focus on is, is debt. Um, and that's one of the things that obviously was a big buzzword and everybody was very worried about in, at the end of the last cycle. And I think debt's a lot healthier now than it was in 2006, seven, eight. But that doesn't mean that um, we aren't starting to see, you know, loan to values go higher. And uh, having some flexibility with your lender, I think is it, it, tremendously important, whether that's a lower prepayment penalty, um, and a lot of this is, is stuff you need to think about on the front end is, um, you know, uh, it does cost you a little bit more to get some prepayment flexibility on the loans, but in a time when you've got to execute, you've got to move quickly, it's, it's very valuable uh, to have that flexibility. So are there are any other kinds of flexibility, you know, in the loan that we need to be thinking about that, that you didn't mention or, or maybe go over those again, just things that, that, okay, you know, this is important to have in this loan or this type of debt. Uh, to make sure that we're prepared. Sure. So it, it also depends on your lender. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you have a, a lot of the value add properties that we've done, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they or HUD, they wouldn't lend on the property uh, because it needs a lot of work or because it wasn't quite occupied enough. And the bridge loans, while they're a great tool, 
um, they allow you to get higher leverage. And you know, if you're going up to 85% of the costs of a deal, you better be sure that you're going to create some value or at least have the flexibility with your lender or a good relationship with your lender. Um, and again, back to communication with lender as well. We found that if your lender understands step by step what you're doing and where you're hitting your goals and where you're not, they're a lot more flexible than if you just call them one day and say, hey, we got a problem. Um, so I would put, and I hadn't even thought about that, but that relationship with the lender and sometimes in some cases is just as important as a relationship with the investor. Mm. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. And, and, uh, you know, and I wanted to go back to the first thing and I wanted to ask too, you know, like maybe the responses that you all have received um, in this first step of, and I wanted to go back to contacting, educating the investors and it's something I thought of when, you know, you, if you all are projecting a lesser return because of a potential downturn, you know, it, maybe give us an example of how you're explaining that to an investor. Well, specifically, even right now, it, it could also be in a change of strategy. So um, as I've mentioned, a lot of the equity, we are a syndicator, and, and, but we have also done funds. And right now, one of the ways that we're communicating to our investors is we're raising a fund. And the fund that we're raising is focused on what's coming next, the opportunity that we see. Because the problem that we're having now is we're not seeing enough opportunities to keep our investors happy. And so the way that we're communicating with them is through a new vehicle to say, hey, this is what we're seeing. This is how we'd like to raise money now. Maybe it's not today or by the end of 2019, but we do believe that as some of the things change in this market, there's going to be a great opportunity to buy assets. So that fund is a great way for us to continue the communication while also raising money um, from investors in a slightly different way and with a slightly different strategy. So sometimes it's... It, the communication becomes self-evident in, in what you're seeing in the market. Um, because right now, my biggest complaint from my investors is, hey, when's your next deal coming? And unfortunately, where, um, you know, in 2013, we wanted to buy everything we saw. In 2016, it was harder, but we still wanted to buy a lot of stuff. Right now, I mean, it's like uh, one in a hundred. Every time you see a deal, um, you know, there are other people out there really competitive, uh, competitive and they're competing with you. So everybody sees a good deal and you descend on it. And before you know it, the prices have raised enough because it's a competitive bidding environment where uh, it's too expensive and it's not as good of a deal as it was when you first identified it. So um, there are a number of ways that we do that. And, and I think the, the change in strategy from how you're raising your money and, and exactly how you're deploying it um, can be a very helpful way to communicate with the investors what you're seeing in the market and how to adjust your strategy to raise the funds. Mm, no, that's interesting. That's a neat, that's a great strategy. Yeah. And then you're going to have that capital available. Uh, yeah. When you need it. So, um, so you're educating the investors and, uh, now, and you talked about the debt. What is there another step after that? Yeah, I think, um, beyond that, it's, it's, having a actual market strategy, which is, it's funny to say, but you get so caught up in, I'm a value add apartment investor. This is what I'm going to go look for that. For instance, we, we saw a deal recently that was new construction delivered in 2017. And when we started comparing the returns, we, we kind of slapped ourselves in the head and said, man, maybe we should be chasing some of this other stuff because this property was selling for closer to a six cap rate where a lot of the value add properties we were trying to buy were low five cap rate or even high fours in some of the nicer markets that we were competing in. So if you can get that kind of a spread while also buying something new, there may not be the same upside, but you're also not having to buy it and do all that work and, and capture that upside, which the truth is it may be in the underwriting. You may think you can do it, but you haven't done it. So um, some of the opportunities we're starting to see is just is, paying attention to the market, looking at, even if you don't think a deal is going to work for you, look at it, underwrite it, see where the returns are, because ultimately we're all chasing yield and we're all chasing the higher IRRs and higher cash flow. And sometimes you get so focused on one particular area, like opportunistic um, value add apartments right now, everybody has money raised for that. And that's why we're starting to change our strategy a little bit to see if we can identify some of the alpha in the market, some of the opportunity that other people aren't seeing. And again, we communicate that through our fund vehicle or when we're calling investors to raise capital for a particular deal, because they always ask the question, why this deal? Why now? And so that's a, that's a focus of ours is, is to have a market strategy and be able to say, hey, we're going to start chasing this deal and here's why. And that informs the other parts of our process, both with lenders and also with the investors. Um, 
and, and I see a lot of people chasing a very particular type of deal. And sometimes you, as I said, you get very focused on that and you miss some of the better opportunities out there. Mm. Could you, could you elaborate or give us any more, more examples of like that, that better deal or the value that you all are finding or looking for now? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we're really interested in is the idea that there's been so much opportunistic or value add investing right now that eventually you're going to get to a point where um, you're going to find apartments that they've already been upgraded. Or instead of saying, hey, we, re we finished the leasing office and we cleaned up the pool and we put a new roof on it and we did 15 upgrades um, and, and we're getting this kind of a increase on rent for that upgrade and you have, now you have 90% of the property that you can go do it. Eventually that's gonna to change to, hey, we've done 70% of the upgrades and there are only a few left. Um, who wants this? And right now there's not a lot of money out there for I'm done. I've done all the upgrades. And so that's what we're starting to think about too is eventually all of these product, all, these, all this product, all of these people who are uh, upgrading these properties are going to need someone to sell it to on the back end, but all the money is raised to do all the work. So we're always thinking about gaps like that. And so I think that's the perfect example. And I don't think we've seen it yet, but that's part of why I said, we're trying to get the money raised now, have the dry powder so that we can take advantage of what we see coming. And as we all know, we could be wrong. Uh, it could be something else or a whole nother opportunity. Uh, but I think having that strategy gives you something to talk to your investors about. Yeah. Yeah. Now it shows you all are being proactive and prepared. Uh, so how are you finding your, your data? Like what, what data are you looking at and how are you finding that? Um, a lot of the data we have is uh, through CoStar, which is a service that, that we use. It's got great data. Uh, there are other uh, products out there like Reese that, that you can get. Um, one of the best actual sources of data now is since we've been acquiring properties for since 2012 for seven or eight years now, we've got this database of old OMs. And hmm. so we're, all, we're also using our own existing database that we didn't even realize we were building uh, because, you know, I got a, you get a CA on a, a property, you fill it out and they send you an OM and you decide you don't like it, but you save it in your file. And then later, seven years later, you've got a property down the street and you've got old data that you can go look at and say, wow, here's, this is where the market's gone and this is what's happened in these properties. Or um, uh, collection data is another perfect example. We can go through our files um, because it's very hard to find you know, delinquency data. This actually happened to us this week where we went through a bunch of old files from um, deals that we were looking to acquire and started doing analysis on what, what do the actual numbers say uh, for delinquency in this particular area, that particular area. And a lot of times we don't have enough data, but in this instance, we had four or five properties that we were able to find because we were focused on a particular area and we were able to compare the delinquency on one of our properties today to what the others in the market had. So um, that's become a great source too. And that's data that is available to anybody that's willing to fill out a confidentiality agreement with a broker. If you're just focused on particular areas, you can get an enormous amount of data. Um, and obviously, you know, because it's confidentiality, you can't share it, but you can use it for your own internal purposes and, and making determinations about market. Love that. No, that's awesome. Collect, uh, yeah, collect all that da data. I mean, they're sending it to you, right? Right. Uh, yeah, that's, that's incredible too. If you're, if you're, if you have a good, I guess, filing system or system of saving, you know, old uh, um, operating memorandums and, and there's so much information there. Uh, and so, you know, what, can I ask what markets you all are looking in and buying in? Sure. Yeah. We're very focused on the Southeastern United States. Um, we are based in Atlanta and it would just so happen that we love Atlanta. Um, I think Atlanta is a great market, but um, we, we like the Sunbelt. We, we very much believe in the Southeast. Our opinion is that uh, the internet and, and a number of other factors have contributed to people being able to choose where they live and work. And um, as long as you've got some of the basic structure in place, people are going to be able to determine that they don't want snow drifts. Um, and so we see people moving out west and into the southeast and because the southeast is our our neck of the woods that's where we're focused on so um from a market to market standpoint we really like atlanta charlotte um, raleigh durham the piedmont triad in north carolina a uh, few markets in south carolina um, chattanooga nashville uh, birmingham alabama all the way down to you know the coastal uh, uh, charleston south carolina savannah georgia and even you know, Tampa, Florida, uh, we like the Panhandle and, and Orlando. Um, this time of year, it's not 
we don't like Florida quite as much because you're dodging hurricanes, but it's a, it's a great state. And I believe the data shows more people are moving to Florida than, than anywhere um, within the U.S. So we think that trend's going to continue. So we're very focused on small and medium-sized markets in, in today because we think pricing in some of the larger markets have, have gotten extremely high. Um, but we're, we're keeping a close eye on all the, the major markets and, and cities in the southeast. Yeah, after this hurricane, we may see that switch, right? People going back north. <laughs> yeah, it's. <laughs> I'm just and, kidding. And we, and we dodged it. We dodged a bullet on on that one. It seemed to just sure kind of bounce off. But um, most of the time, we're not that lucky. So we definitely get that. That's one of the great things about Atlanta, in general, too. We really don't get hurricanes. Yeah, we get tornadoes. But other than that, that strange one a few years ago that went right through downtown, they don't. They tend to not do that much damage. We have no seismic activity. So. Um, between that and and our huge airport, Atlanta's uh, is definitely our favorite market. Do you have an example of maybe a market that you all were really focused on, uh, but now I've said, oh wait a minute, because this is happening in the market or whatever it may be in this specific market that we're gonna we're gonna hold off there for a while. And and could you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure, I think Nashville is the perfect example of of that. Um, I love Nashville. I think it's a great place. Um, and I would love to invest there, but I think the prices are really high. They've done a tremendous amount of new class A development this cycle. And as we approach the end of the cycle, I've got a bad feel. I remember what Atlanta did and I think Atlanta's taken a, a big step forward, but as you approach the end of the cycle and you have that much new construction and your economy is heavily focused on tourism, which Nashville is, um, I, I do think that Nashville is something that scares me today, but it's really just a pricing issue. Um, if, uh, if the prices were a little bit, uh, lesser or there was less attention on that market, I would love to be in Nashville. And that's how we feel about every market. It's really, you know, for, for a price, we're willing to go almost anywhere. Um, it almost always is about how many other people love that market. So when you start hearing, um, I love that market too much, the prices tend to go up. So we, we have, have avoided some of the Nashville deals just because the pricing has been so high. Wow. Now, so uh, awesome. Now, I'm, I've got to pivot and we're going to go to a few last questions before we run out of time. But, you know, a broker asked you, um, you know, like your buying criteria, you know, what, what's your answer? Uh, I think we're right now, I think we're looking for, um, you know, 80s to early 2000s product. Uh, but we're starting to expand that to some newer construction. And I, I do think that our, our biggest criteria is that if it's, if it's something that doesn't have a great box right now, if you're not quite sure who the person is that's going to buy this asset because of one reason or another, we really want that phone call. And that's part of our goal right now as we're raising money in our fund to, see, to, to search and, and seek the properties that aren't getting as much attention to figure out why and if there's an opportunity there. Um, if you bring a 1985 to 1995 product to market that's all original interiors, you're going to be competing against everybody. And it's almost impossible to win that deal for us. Um, without paying a really high price. So we're trying to focus on where other people aren't going right now. And, and I think that that gives us a wide area of age, but also gives us um, uh, some brokers something to think about. You know, whenever they see a deal and they think, geez, I'm not sure who's gonna buy this, I can call Steve. So that's, that's where, really what we're thinking about right now. Mm. And Steve, what's been the hardest part of this syndication journey for you? Like whether from its way back or maybe just a couple, one, one thing that was like, this was the hardest part for me to get past. I, I think the hardest part is the first deal. I, you know, the, the very first time that you have to go out and convince people without a track record. Um, the advantage we have now is we can go to people and put in front of them, we made this much money and this much money and this much money. And you still have to make the effort. You still have to raise the capital. You still have to go to the meetings and you still have to do your job. But the first time you're basically going out there and saying, trust me, I know what I'm doing. I just don't have the data to show you. So I, I think the most difficult part was that, you know, the first deal, and I, I remember all of them, um, when you're going out and you're saying, trust me, and not just to the investors, but to the lender. Uh, I remember the first time we, we got a Fannie Mae loan and, you know, the underwriters are looking at you saying, you know, on whose expertise am I making this loan? And you have to say on mine. And then they, the next question is, how many units have you purchased? And you say, well, none, but let me tell you why 
I've got this background and that background, and that's really where my background as an analyst helped because after spending almost a decade as an analyst at, at a company like CBRE, I had a lot of credibility. So that, that really helped, but that was definitely the hardest part. Mm -hmm. And so what's a way that you all have recently improved your business that we can apply to ours? Well, I definitely think that um, focusing on the little things, um, it, it's, it's shocking, but if, if you get you very focused on you know, the major problems that you have, you miss that almost all the major problems are caused by little problems. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you brought up the model. We're constantly tweaking our model. We call it a living document. And so whenever we see something that we don't like in our Excel model, we change it and we make it better. And sometimes that little tweak can change your IRR or change your cash flow. And you've been doing it wrong for seven or eight years. So we're focused on that. And then also on a property level as well um, is, uh, you know, making some minor changes that will have a big effect on, on the outcome. For instance, recently this year, we're, we're making an attempt to go all cashless payments and all checklist payments. So we're trying to get all of our residents paying through ACH or credit card or some uh, through electronic means. And it's a huge undertaking, but we believe it will help in, in delinquency and others in other ways. And it's something that you never would have thought about um, if you're not really focused on your little problems, like how can I improve my delinquency or how can I make it easier for people to pay me? Mm. Uh, it's interesting to, and you all can do that because you're managing your properties as well, right? Correct. Yeah. I think, um, one of our big advantages that we can tell people, uh, investors too, that, that they really like to hear is um, when, when you write us a check or when you invest with us, the money never loses my side or I never lose sight of your money. You know, it never leaves me. Um, and, and also we are hiring all the employees. We're taking care of everything on site. And there are a lot of great property managers out there. We do some third party management as well. But um, I do think it is one of our advantages to being able to say, you know, soup to nuts, we can do it all for you. And, you know, conversely, the challenge is, you know, you have to answer the question of who are you? Are you, a, are you an investor operator or are you a property manager? So I think it's a double-edged sword, but we, we find that it's beneficial to, to say that we are in control from day one uh, with every aspect of the deal. What, you know, in, in 10 seconds or less, what, what's your, your best advice for taking care of investors so they want to come back? Do what you say you're going to do. Very simple. Uh, number one thing that's contributed to your success. Uh, hard work. <laughs> Love it. Plain and simple. Yeah, and, not giving and, up. And how, how do you like to give back? Um, we, we really like to do it through, um, uh, I, I think, uh, through our family, through our employees. We have over uh, or approaching 100 employees right now. And, and we like to make sure that it's a great place to work and that we can take care of people. And, and it actually goes back to what I said about do what you say you're going to do is just do the right thing, like treat people well, and tends to, tends to be that things uh, turn out well for, well for you. Nice. Steve, amazing interview. I've really enjoyed it myself and learned a lot. And I know the listeners have as, as well. I know it was going to be very popular. And, uh, but thank you very much for your time and sharing your expertise. Tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you as well. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, again, Steve O'Brien with Arkin Capital and you can uh, go to arkincapital.com. That's A-R-C-A-N-C-A-P-I-T-A-L.com. And you have all the contact information for us there. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.